सो हेलो एवरी वन वेलकम टू सून आई एस नाउ दिस इज गोइंग टू अ शॉर्ट एंड स्मॉल सेशन इन लाइन विद योर ऑन गोइंग सीरीज ऑफ हाई यीडिंग टॉपिक्स एंड वी आर डिस्कसिंग स्पेसिफिक टॉपिक्स रिलेटेड टू मॉडर्न इंडियन हिस्ट्री नो आई होप द फर्स्ट सेक्शन वेयर वी वर डिस्कसिंग अबाउट द इनैक्टमेंट्स ब्रॉड बाय द ब्रिटिशर्स टू कंट्रोल द इंडियंस यू मस्ट हैव लाइक डेट अ लॉट ऑफ दम वर कवर्ड ओवर देयर दिस इज इन सीक्वेंस ऑफ दैट इन द सेकेंड पार्ट ऑफ इट सो विल बी टॉकिंग अबाउट अ लॉट मोर एक्ट्स एंड इनैक्टमेंट्स which were uh, which took place or which were made by the britishers immediately after the revolt of 1857 after basically after 1860 uh, and between 1905 now this is a period which is very 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 essential okay uh, upsc has got or have understood very well that all each and everything which happened after 1905 till 1947 is something students are not gonna leave behind no matter what but this very period okay and the legislation look government of india act whether it is 1919 whether it is 1935 you are going to read okay uh, crisp mission cabinet mission wevel plan it's not it's not thing like you are not going to read it no matter what if you are going to appear for exam and you are serious about your preparation you will do it but the acts and enactments made by the british government or british indian government so called uh, to regulate the working of indian state is something which always is given a miss and we have already known that in the past years the topics like age of consent act has been asked so you never know what else they will ask from this very area so some of the important acts and enactments which ha have influence even now are something we are going to discuss in this lecture okay so let's proceed uh, and before moving forward let me also tell you about something very specific so shunya is is also brought has brought this uh, crash course for you so if you are very serious about your preparation if you are give, appearing in this 2023 examination uh, the prelims oriented preliminary examination oriented crash course will be very helpful for you make sure you go on the website the link is uh, below the video go through it um, check out the course if if it, you find it helpful make sure to join it and take advantage of it uh you also need to know that uh, shunai is also providing you the handbooks uh and they will help you a lot because now the note making problem is also resolved okay so check out the books check out the course its uh, link is in uh, information section below the video now let's start with the enactment section second okay 1860 to 1905 is the period we have to discuss let's proceed with that okay so the first law which was brought after 1860 is very important one is female infanticide prevention act female infanticide prevention act 1870 now what is this female infanticide prevention act so one of a major problem and this problem exists in india from the historical times theek hai usme aisa kuch nahi hai ki this is something which is then of britishers this is our own misdoing so patriarchy has been such that uh, male and female divisions are there and we know that the problem of feticide for, uh, or feticide is basically targeting female children and so you will see that somewhere around 18 1795 itself the britishers took this thing into stance but around 1870 to finally the britishers or british government took step and made it compulsory mandatory that you have to register the child birth of the child i hope every one of you must be having a birth certificate okay the whole silsila the whole parampara of having a birth certificate comes from here and the birth certificate thing was written to be made at the very the moment a child is born whether it's a female male okay the child has to be registered if right now the this goes like because now most of the deliveries do happen in a hospital in a uh, defined uh, system so the registration work starts from there itself the institution does it on your own uh, behalf of the parents but even in the case if a child is born at home then also the registration has to be done the registration registration process has to be started within 3 days okay that's how it works so this whole thing starts with female infanticide prevention act actually it was this enactment which has the basic agenda that if you have registered the birth of a child the chances of you actually killing the child is very less because back in the day that was a reality that if a, there was a female child was born 
the parents, the family members themselves used to kill the child. Usually what you used to do, it, they used to drown the child in a big amount or huge amount of milk. Okay, a bucket of milk, they used to drown the child. That is how they used to do it. Okay, so you just keep this thing in mind that Female Infanticide Prevention Act 1870 is important because of your birth certificate traces its origin over there. Okay, now the next one is the Christian Personal Law 1872. You might have heard about the Intercaste Act, Intercaste Marriage Act. Okay, so Intercaste Marriage for the first time got legality or legal approval of the state through this enactment. Now, but this is also true that uh, uh, this law was brought with a different intention that the law was brought with this intention look many a time what used to happen is uh, a lot of native indians whether they were hindus or muslim or sikh or from any other uh, faith but they were from native origin they were converting to christianity when they were converting to christianity they were founding themselves at two difficult positions first of all it was difficult for them to take over the properties of their ancestors already there was an enactment in 1850 which have resolved this issue but after the revolt of 1857, the Britishers found it difficult to implement the terms of those uh, laws. So in 1872, the law was made that all those people who have become Christian already, who are natives and have converted to Christianity, they can go back and take over the properties and have the control on the ancestral claims. First thing. The second thing was already the intercaste marriages were allowed in 1871 but there was huge opposition from the natives against the intercaste and i hope you must be aware of this thing that the intercaste and interdining was a very big taboo for a very long period of time intercaste still is a very big taboo in many part of the country that's a reality but in these times it was official no no for all the communities so you will see that intercaste was first intercaste marriage was first allowed by the Britishers and subsequently the very next year since there was so much opposition that they brought the intercaste thing only into Christianity that okay if you uh, it will only be there for the Christian community and it also brought the Christian marriages and Christian people in line with uh, the Hindus and Muslims so basically it, many uh, scholars have also stated that this was the first step taken by any India government towards a uniform civil code and that is something which is very much in news and therefore this could be asked in the examination fine Achha. next one criminal tribes act 1871 this is again something very important like you must have heard about this that something happened and some some one some revolutionary was arrested and then their whole village their whole community had to pay for it sometime the whole villages were uh, has to face the whole problem of bedakhli they were kicked out of lands okay or other problems or the whole community was arrested many a time for a misdoing of a single person these things were evolved as a criminal tribes act so the when the britishers came and the biggest problem they say also in the 18th century itself they saw that groups like pindaris now not they were not only pindaris they were other groups and factions too okay there were other groups and factions too so the idea is very simple that uh, britishers have got this notion inside them that in india there are many communities there are many tribal groups who are going to act in a ill what what the britishers call the Ill illegal manner or they are going to kill people they are going to loot people but it's 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 a reality of the world that people do these things but when then we also know then that a specific person or a specific group of people do these things it's not like the whole tribe or whole ethnicity is to be blamed for this okay so Britishers but started doing this only they said that there are certain tribe of people there are certain group or certain ethnic ethnicity of people who are always employed uh, uh, in these kind of activities which are considered illegal or criminal by the Britishers and therefore they shortlisted a group of tribes which were called as criminal tribes and Britishers as a policy as a minted policy made sure that against them more and more action is taken fine so they it was also made sure that uh, the de the development opportunities don't reach them 
they are as a minted policy they were muzzled so you will see that even in the modern times many the many of the scheduled tribes and scheduled caste people who back in the day used to be from the criminal tribes act or who were persecuted because of the criminal tribes act are one of the most oppressed people or most exploited people even in the 21st century now post independence government of india 1952 uh, decriminalized all these tribes and subsequently government of india also started taking steps the steps were taken up till 2008 also in 2008 again government of india released a separate economic package to help those people who are successor of those people who were declared from the criminal tribe by the britishers because you can understand the kind of exploitation which these people had to face okay so the criminal tribes act was brought in 1871 and it is still impacts our society okay so you should know it indian contract act now the indian contract act is still implemented even with obviously with a lot of uh, amendments and a lot of improvement regarding as per the requirement of the present day and times but the indian contract act goes back to 1872 that was the first time when the britishers decided that a proper legislative legalized legislative code has to be defined so that in the coming years in the coming time how the acts and enactments the relationships the uh, the contracts between people businesses institutions have to be done okay so indian contract act talks about that thing next one dramatic performance act 1876 now you must have heard about vernacular press act or even the arms act vernacular press act and arms act both goes to 1878 and these are very important because of two because it is related with lord lytton and they were again in a way a segregative uh, racist kind of enactments okay they are also considered as one of the prime reason for the calling of the first congress in 1885 along with ilbert bill but along with these enactments you will see there was one more enactment and that is a dramatic performance act 1876 you need to understand that the bengali intellig intelligentsia in the 19th century was pretty active they were now taking more and more steps and they were coming up uh, in a modern and very inquisitive ways in which they can criticize the government so not only the journalists were writing research, writing the news editorials in which they were criticizing the government and to be precise lord lytton in 1876 1877 because of his inefficient way of looking at or inefficient behavior towards the drought and the famine situation but you will also see that they came up very interesting form of plays and dramas which were performed around the calcutta city lytton was highly upset of because of this and therefore he passed this enactment so that the natives could not make performance and through the performance cannot have a laugh at lord lytton which kind of had become the order of the day look a, a ruler the elite the the one who runs the states are no, never terrified of people if the people are going to threaten them by violence the only thing they are always afraid of is people laughing at them once you start laughing at the ruler or once you are la going to laugh at the leader fir ho gaya uska kaam ab izzat gayi so that is very important to the ruler the leader that either you hate him you love him you maintain neutrality that's fine but don't laugh at them and this is exactly what was happening in bengal of 1870s because of these dramatic performances and that's why they were this enactment was brought to muzzle down the indian dramatic performances okay now murderous outrage regulation 1877 again this was again introduced in bengal and again by lord lytton only and this was done with the intention of clearing out any sense of militancy on the ground so any group of people whom the government thought or basically lord lytton thought that they could be involved in a murderous activity then action has to be taken against them that's it okay so that you have to keep in mind now indian treasure trove act 1878 this act was used by later on by mrs gandhi also during the emergency so 
a law was passed by the britishers that if by mistake or by someone if all of a sudden from somewhere you get a treasure trove khajana mil jaye aapko kahin se so aisa nahi hai ki aap kahenge bhai khajana mujhe mila to khajana mera okay and even you cannot say ki mere dada ji ke dada ji ke dada ji ne khajana rakha tha nahi doesn't works that way okay the government actually takes over the whole of the treasure trove unless and until you come up with proper legal documents proving that these were sanctioned for you only or it belongs to your family and if goes for like four or five five generation beyond even if it's in your family then also government has a say that how how much the treasure tro trove is how it could be used okay so you will see even now for example there are so much issue about the various temples in uh, kerala the erstwhile state uh, royal family of travancore they try still to maintain control on lot of temples in which a lot of jewelries and lot of uh, treasure trove is there okay as long as those uh, buildings are closed are out of the limit of uh, people it's fine but the day it gets open government will have a say so you should also keep that thing in mind negotiable instruments act 1881 okay this was also brought by, uh, immediately after uh, lipton it was brought by ripon and as we know that ripon is considered liberal in comparison to lipton a lot more okay and therefore it was brought with the intention that how the negotiations have to be performed in the enactment in the detailing okay that is why it was introduced in 1880s by ripon it also played a very vital and important role when ripon started acting more for the municipal corporation and other stuff it is also stated that when ilbert bill was brought in after the negotiable uh, instrument act you will see that uh, ilbert had to face difficulties because ripon was already under pressure for passing this enactment transfer of property act 1882 again one of a bigger problem was how as you must have heard even now that you have the op option of uh, transferring there are various way of transferring a property to someone else you can uh, give them over you can gift them you can sell them you can just transfer it how these things are decided that in what manner how you have given certain property to someone so we have already read about the, the santhal pargana act and later on came the chota nagpur tenancy act and basically it was a technique of the government so that the region could be curtailed for the outsiders so the for example the santhal pargana act makes sure that the santhals cannot sell their properties to non santhals who are coming from outside something very similar was done in the chota nagpur tenancy act in 1908 for the munda tribesmen but in between it you also need to regulate those people or basically the relationship between those people who are going to transfer the property how you are going to do it do you have to pay the stamp duty what's the government stand is on okay and whether in certain cases like if you are some suppose you don't want to take money but you still just want to gift some property to someone will the government still uh, ask you for the stamp duties and all so all those things are decided by the transfer of property act 1882 so that you have to understand the indian immigration act 1883 is two fold it is the first part is related to indian women and the second part is related to a uh, route of pacific ocean so let's understand each one by one so with regards to indian women what happened so you must have heard few years back only the saudi arabian government allowed the women to travel outside the saudi arabian women to travel outside saudi arabia without a permission of a guardian a male guardian or could be a husband or a brother or father but a male guardian it has been allowed just now it's a similar situation was there in india too till 1883 so indian women who also had to take permissions which from the male guardian before going outside the british india now this rule was changed in 1883 okay and the indian women or women native women who are living in british india were allowed to go outside india with on their own accord it was done specifically regarding the issue of indentured laborers 
Now you need to understand that a lot of Indian men were working around the world. So in Jamaica, in Guyana, in Mauritius, in Fiji, in South Africa, okay, on the east coast of Africa. And all these men have went over there as per the indentured lab as the indentured laborers or what was usually called in India as Girmitiya Mazdoor. That is the agreemented laborers. A very big problem came over a period of time because there was lack of Indian women in these places. Most of the Indian men didn't like to go there or just wanted to come back. Okay. And so the British government decided that it will be beneficial if the Indian women are also there. So at least the people will start living over there. And that was the one of the major reason for making sure that the Indian women can move on their own accord. So that is one part which was done in Indian Immigration Act of 1883. Now the other point is because of the law of the mercantilism, every time you are going to travel from India to the western world or to be very specific to the western hemisphere, okay, you had only one path that is you first had to go to London and from London then you can go to what we now call as United States or Mexico or South America or Canada or wherever the hell you want. But the new law is totally different. The new law said that even you can take the Pacific route. So now not only from Bombay or Surat, you can actually take the Bay of Bengal route and go to Singapore and from Singapore you can go to either Fiji or Japan and from there you can cross the Pacific and go on the west coast of North America basically either to Vancouver or to Vancouver in Canada or San Francisco in California, United States. Now this was actually very helpful for the Indian people because you will see that after 1848 when the whole gold rush thing happened in California, the west coast of America started developing and a huge number of Indians started moving to America just like a lot of Indians have moved in 1990s to Gulf countries. So just like Indians started going to Gulf countries, the GCC countries in 1990s because of the petrodollars these countries had, they needed infrastructure buildings and all that thing and Indians were their go-to people. Indians are the people who are extensively working there. They started working for, uh, as the manual laborers initially and now they have were involved in a lot of other stuff also over the period we have evolved. Something very similar happened in the American side also. Okay? So you will see that Indians started after this 1883, Indians started taking the Pacific route and reaching Vancouver and also San Francisco and city like San Francisco, Seattle, Vancouver, all were the designated spots for the Indians. Mostly people who went there were from the Sikh community and from the Ludhiana or Jalandhar Dwap region. And you will see over the period, these were the people who led the whole Gadarite movement from the west coast of Africa. Okay. So because of that and even now there is extensive Sikh community, far, very capable Sikh community in Canada, you can trace back their origin to this enactment, this law only. Okay, So that is also why it is important. So this Indian Immigration Act 1883 is important in that manner. Now the Indian Telegraph Act 1885 is very important because it bettered the efficiency of the working of the government in British government but it was very bad for the viceroys all around India for the Indian viceroy because back in the day it usually with when the telecommunication system was not evolved when the communication channels were not that good it usually took almost three months to carry the information from Canada from uh, London to Calcutta so the sitting governor general and subsequently the viceroy had a lot of leeway Ki, kya un, kya bhai, aapne ye kaam? so viceroy would have stated that decision mere paas tha, I, I did whatever I thought was bad best in the situation but now that was not the thing with the telecommunication system evolved with the telegram system evolved actually you can uh, ask a question from Bombay or Calcutta and you will receive an answer within half an hour period so actually the official discretionary power of the governor general and once the viceroy was actually gone for all practical purposes this all happened in 1870s only 1871-72 was the time period when the telecommunication system evolved because of the telegraph. Fine. Now by 1880s you will see that Britishers now decided because they were now a lot of tele, like just now we have so many telecommunication companies. Back then also there were a lot of telegraph companies, British telegraph companies who were working in India. 
Now the British Indian government decided that these need to be monopolized and there has to be a total control of the British Indian government on the telegraph services in India. Okay, so that it is not used for against the government. And so 1885 you will see that Indian Telegraph Act was passed and it was decided that in if in British India you have to operate for the, tele, the telegraph uh, services you basically have to follow the dictates of the state of the dictate of the government okay so that is where it is coming from and it was the first step towards controlling the telecommunication in India okay age of consent act 1891 now this has already been asked in the examination and I hope so therefore that uh, all the serious aspirants must have some idea, some clue about it already. Now in a basic and simple way you can remember this that age of consent act made sure that the minimum age of a girl child for marriage has to be 12 years. But you need to understand where it was coming from. Two cases happened in 1880s. Okay. First one was Rukma Bai case where Rukma Bai was married to a man when early te uh, when in early teens and actually she was not even her, reached her teens when she was married but it was decided that she will later on go and join her husband uh, in matrimonial life so it was she was 17 around 17 year old when the time came when her husband asked her to come over and start uh, living with him rukma bai was not interested in this and then she said that i uh, won't go and live with my husband even Rukma Bai's parents and to be specific his father was of the opinion that if you don't want to go you should leave with us only, you don't have to go. But now because of the customary Hindu law, the Rukma Bai's husband had a authority here. So he said no she has to come and she has to live with me. She has to come and she has to cohabitate with me. Now Rukma Bai said that I won't go and the case was filed and the judge also because the, that was the practice back then, the judge was forced to uh, pass the law as per Hindu customary law and it was said that Rukma Bai if she will not go and live with her husband then she will be sent to jail for 6 months. And Rukma Bai said that okay if that's the thing I have to pay then let it be I won't go and live with him it's better I will go to jail. Now it became a very big issue and it was even published in British press. So as the story goes that Queen Victoria herself got involved in this case and she being the Empress of India, she became the Empress of India I hope so you know in 1877 only. So she, she cancelled the very, she annulled the matrimony between those, these two people and then the uh, groom was paid actually 2000 rupees from the side of the government for his losses. And Rukma Bai then she she, she, uh, she has come into news by that time. Uh, she went on to uh, study physician. Uh, she wanted to study and become a physician. So she was given a scholarship. She even went to London, although she was never able to complete her education as a physician. And she came back and she got involved with a lot of uh, women emancipation issues. And that's how the thing worked. But this thing brought into an uh, issue in limelight that if you uh, get women married at a very young age you are only going to create difficulties for her so that was first case now the second case happened again uh, in bengal only where you will see that a 11 year old girl child was married uh, to someone in his 30s and while consummating the marriage the girl child died and it became a very big issue that is it feasible to get uh, someone of a age year like 11 year old girl child okay, being married to 11, 30 a man in his 30s and that was considered wrong and so you will see a committee was formed and the decision was taken uh, even Bahramji Malabari and all the other peoples were involved in this and uh, in age of consent act 1891 was passed because the girl child which died was 11 year old you will see that age of consent act made sure that now 12 years has to be the minimum age okay for girl child's marriage so age of consent act I hope so you it have made sense to you Next one, Punjab Land Alienation Act 1900. This is again something very interesting, very important because you need to understand that Punjab is not the way, Punjab was not the way it is right now. Okay. So Punjab is considered both sides, the Indian side as well as the Pakistani side, Punjab is considered as highly lustrous, highly green area, highly fertile, good yield, agricultural land. But that is now how it was back in the day. 
so in 1880s 1870s onwards a lot of irrigation projects were taken by british indian government and a lot of somewhat desertified mid level desertified land was converted into aggregable region because of the irrigation so that happened now because of this you will see what happened is now this land became aggregable okay now you can perform agriculture on this farm lands and these farm lands were now went as per punjab land alienation act all these land as per these enactments were given or were transferred to only those people by the british government who were a ally so you will see a new landed zamindar class evolved in the region of punjab fine and this landed uh, zamindar class was actually far more loyal to the britishers only and from this landed zamindari class only a new set of leaders came in who actually went on to first participate uh, uh, in the unionist party and subsequently also played a very vital role in muslim league and even now the landed zamindari of this region only is considered the elite class in present day pakistan so this thing traces back the query over there so you have to keep this thing in mind and that is why it is important okay ancient monument prevention preservation act 1904 now usually the expectation with lord cousin is this only that lord cousin is someone who totally hated indians and that he was a uh, he was something who didn't wanted uh, bengal to stay as a cradle of nationalism he was ready to go up to any extent to uh, muzzle down the nationalist idea from indians so that is the reason that we passed uh, the universities act of 1904 that is why he uh, made the cids in 1902 and that is also the reason why he then went on to take the greatest blunder step in indian modern history that is the partition of bengal in 1905 but while he was doing all these things against indian nationalists he also did one or two good things and one of that is ancient monument preservation act of 1904 so you will see that he actually took deliberate steps to make sure that a lot of ancient monuments who were in dilapidated condition were taken care of whether it was the taj mahal where if in even if you now if you'll go so the uh, on the uh, first floor actually inside the place where the uh, the dasharas tomb the uh, duplicate tomb is up on the upstairs so just on the top of that there is a green color lamp hanging and that was actually gifted by cousin so upkeep of taj mahal as well as upkeep of humayu storm in delhi as well as upkeep of a lot of other uh, historical buildings not related to um, uh, britishers but actually related to uh, moguls and even the sultanate rulers were given finances and funds by him you will also see that cousin made sure through this ancient monuments preservation act that to provide more funds to asi archaeological survey of india okay and that is in this regard you have to remember ancient monuments preservation act it is even still now applicable with certain amendments now prevention of seditious meeting act 1907 this act was passed immediately after the surat split now the moment surat split happened britishers understood one thing that the now the moderate and extremist faction of the uh, congress have been divided in all clarity it was easy for them because they knew that moderates could be it, they could be offered some easy thing something what they actually did to indian council act in 1909 when they provided them increased number of seats from 16 to 60 in the central legislative assembly on the other hand they took a very straight and uh, straight forward uh, approach towards the extremist faction so what you can call it that carrot and the stick policy that while carrot was given to the moderate faction the extremist had to face the hammer of uh, the british empire and the immediate uh, action was taken on leaders like lal bal and pal so lal lajpat rai was under such a huge uh, stress that he has to escape and he went to brit america and stayed in america for a very long period of time and uh, then bipin chanpal and was under so much pressure that he converted his stance and at the very last moment he called himself actually aligned to moderate faction and not a radical extremist faction because of this only you will see that after the 1907 incident no one really talked about him 
you will never hear about Bipin Chanpal ever after 1907. The third and in a way the most important one, Bal Gangadhar Tilak, you will see that by 1908 in because of his editorial on the Kingsford bombing case or the Muzaffarpur bombing case, uh, he was arrested and under the Seditious Activities Act, he was jailed for six years making sure that he was not present anywhere to do anything. Fine. So the Prevention of Sedition Meeting Act was, was in queue with this only and the idea was that each and every time the Indians gathered somewhere, the local DC, the district collectors had the authority to check the mandate of the meeting, what things are being discussed and if the meetings are going to discuss the political orientation or the political happening of the state, those meetings could be immediately stopped and the leaders who have organized the meeting could have been arrested under the seditious meeting act okay so that was something passed in 1907 so you have to always read this enactment along with the surat split and its impact yeah so i think so this was actually the last one which you needed to go through and the next lecture we will start the enactments which happened after 1905 this one actually is uh, happening after 1905 only but the po point was that since we were discussing about Lord Cousin and this happened after the Surat split which is somehow connected with uh, the uh, uh, Swadeshi and Baikot movement and that was connected with the, uh, the Bengal partition I thought I will keep it here only. So now after this the other enactments which took place till 1947 which will be discussed in the next lecture. I hope you must have liked this a video uh, a PDF containing all the information I have given you in this lecture is also there below the video so you can download from the link uh, and any other information regarding the crash course and all you can go through the link and check out and subscribe to the course okay that will be all for now let's catch up in the next lecture thank you and have a nice day